Episode 7 of the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by United Poultry Concerns. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can find all our other shows at our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org, and I welcome your feedback and comments. My email is hope at upc-online.org. On today's podcast, we have an interview with journalist Martha Rosenberg, and we're going to talk with her about her in-depth research into pharmaceutical use in animal agriculture. And I, mean, I knew that they were using a lot of drugs on the animals, but I had no idea the kinds of chemicals and pharmaceuticals that they were pumping into these animals and how much the animals suffer from them as well. We often look at big ag pharma issues as human health issues only because we're taking in that stuff when, when people eat the animal products. But these drugs can really harm the animals as well. So Martha will illuminate us on all that. And it makes me even more grateful that I have not been eating animals for 30 years and haven't been ingesting all those chemicals yet another great reason to be vegan. It's a really eye-opening interview. But first, I wanted to talk about a concept that has always bothered me since I've been thinking deeply about these issues. And it's an aspect of the humane hoax. The humane hoax is the subject of my book. And I pulled the definition here so I could read it to you. The humane hoax is defined as new language and labels depicted in animal product marketing that convey a false narrative about the humane treatment and sustainable management of farmed animal operations. The aspect of the humane hoax that I want to talk about on this episode has to do with the contradiction or the cognitive dissonance, really, of labeling meat humane labeling the flesh of a slaughtered animal as humane or implying in the labeling and marketing of meat that the animal had a happy life, the animal was happy. And this also applies to eggs and dairy products because the animals die an untimely death in those industries as well. People who are buying humanely labeled meat, they are essentially saying that as long as the animal had a good life and a swift end, that it isn't so bad that they're killed. Well, I've had a good life, and I've lived much longer equivalently than most farmed animals ever get. So how about a quick death for me? And use my body for products for sale? No, of course not. Even though my life has much more detrimental impact on the earth than a chicken, we value human life and we would find it unacceptable to kill me just because of my usefulness that I could sell a product. This is speciesism. It's the false assumption of the superiority of one species over others. The right to live a full life is every animal's birthright. Those chickens want to live. They will fight for life if threatened. They will fight for their families' lives if they're threatened. We have no right to take away their very life. If you really break down the humane meat phenomenon, it's odd that people can show great concern for how farmed animals are treated while they're alive, and yet don't seem to be bothered or troubled by their slaughter. This fact demonstrates the inability to recognize the normal various gradations of moral transgressions against one another with killing being the most immoral of acts. If you look at our criminal justice system, it's based on the idea that punishment should be proportional to the crime and we, as a society, have institutionalized varying gradations of punishment proportional to how serious we consider a crime to be. There's a general consensus around the entire world, pretty much, that taking another's life is amongst the most serious of crimes, the most egregious. But farmed animals are somehow exempt from this gradation of transgressions. The extent to which our society values human life is highly admirable. 
why are non-human animals not afforded the same consideration? An animal has the same will to live as a human does. Animals have the same capacity to suffer as humans do. Animals have much the same consciousness, awareness, emotional complexity. Are they really so different? Speciesism is at the core of this. Speciesism has made it normal to see animals as objects for commodification. We have denied some animals a place in our circle of compassion. Not all animals. Companion animals are now mostly considered basically family members with all the protections that that implies. But because we think of meat and dairy and eggs as essential, farmed animals fall outside this circle of care and compassion, and we fail to properly assess the gravity of the act of killing. There's a sense that it's okay to kill a young, healthy, farmed animal as long as they were treated well. The one bad day scenario, you hear this said by some humane meat farmers that, oh, our animals only had one bad day, meaning the day they went to the slaughterhouse. Even though we would never consider this ethical to do to our companion animals. I mean, killing our dog when they've just been alive a few months like chickens, or killing our cat when they are just a couple of years old, like a dairy cow. The consideration that killing is the worst transgression is not limited to humans in our society. We have comprehensive anti-cruelty laws for companion animals, not only in the U.S., but all over the world to varying degrees that also allow for this logical progression. In companion animal cruelty cases, the charges can become more severe depending on if the animal was killed as a result of the neglect or abuse, sometimes going from misdemeanors to a felony if the animal died as a result of the neglect or abuse. So if you kill a dog, it's considered cruelty so extreme in some cities and states that you could get felony charges and jail time but kill a hundred cows a day and you get a paycheck. We have made farmed animals exempt from our basic moral and ethical understandings of the degree and severity of offenses and have somehow, I think, compensated for this, what must be a nagging unconscious cognitive dissonance with the compromise that farmed animals must be treated well while they're alive. And that's kind of where we are now with humane labeling. And while this is a good first step in, in admitting that farmed animals suffer in animal farming, the logical extension of this thinking would be that we should not kill them at all, as killing is the worst of all acts that we can commit against one another. We don't extend the same recognition to farmed animals that is the cornerstone of our criminal justice system, that taking a life is the highest transgression, much worse than any crime that allows for the survival of the victim. Of course, these animals are completely innocent, and I, I hate having to compare them to, this, to the criminal justice system and the criminals, but... It's the best analogy. It's the only place really where we analyze the morality of hurting and killing one another. Life is an animal's most cherished possession. And animals, like humans, will fight to survive. Animals share similar behaviors to humans regarding their will to live. It's absurd to speak of humane treatment of animals when it comes to their handling and management and food and shelter. If you deny them the most basic right, the right to live out their lives, and you condone or are complacent in their slaughter, it makes no sense. And I will add an important factor here that just because there's a humane label certainly doesn't mean that the animal didn't suffer. And that's a discussion for a whole nother podcast that I will get to probably. But if you want to learn more, I really encourage you to read my book, The Ultimate Betrayal. It's all about the, the totality of the humane hoax. 
But interestingly, what we're talking about here, this part of the humane hoax, I feel is one of the more positive aspects. Humane labeling is saying that this company, the company that is using a humane label, that their animals are happy and all the other animals in farming are not, basically. So it's, it's, it's allowing society, it's causing society to accept that animals suffer in farming, that animals feel pain, that they experience trauma and physical and emotional distress, that they are not happy in farming. The logical extension of this thinking is that it is a violent violation to kill them. We'll get there. I believe, I deeply believe we will get there. To say that a human has the right to kill is speciesist. It is wrong to kill someone just because they're not human. Chickens and other farmed animals are sentient beings. Just because one species is culturally dominant and can kill another does not mean we should. It's unnecessary and we live healthier, longer, and with way less ecological impact on a vegan diet. Okay, so here's a question to offer an example. Would you rather be murdered or assaulted with a baseball bat? I know, just horrible to think about, but bear with me here. Even though being beaten with a baseball bat would certainly be painful and potentially debilitating, potentially lifelong debilitation, most rational people, if faced with this horrible choice, would choose the beating over being killed. We want to live we value life over any other consideration of well-being. Well, guess what? Animals do too. To illustrate the point differently, would you hit a pig with a baseball bat? Of course not. And it would generally be seen as completely unacceptable for a producer to do so. You could go to the street and ask anyone, no matter their diet, if they think it would be okay for a pork producer to hit a pig with a baseball bat. They would say, of course, no, no, you can't do that. So then why is it acceptable to inflict the much greater violation and kill the pig? It makes no sense. When it comes to farmed animals, we tend to consider the lesser infraction of animal cruelty of inflicting pain to be the greater moral wrong than the much greater transgression of killing the animal, of actually taking their life. Somehow we have distorted our moral compass when it comes to farmed animals and we condone the killing of these certain species and market the meat as humanely raised, but killing an animal who wants to live is anything but humane. It's, it's an illogical conflict of our morals. It's in opposition of our ethics. I've seen friends and family weep over the loss of their dog or cat, but then shed no tears and have not a second thought for the animals that they'll eat that same day, who certainly suffered much more than their dog or cat ever did. But if they knew the chicken and the misery she endured and saw her suffering every day and saw her the same way they do a companion animal, they would likely also be distressed that her life was cut short merely for a meal. Most people have compassion for helpless beings and don't want to see them die, just like the injured bird who fell out of her nest, just like this starving stray dog. How are they different from a chicken? Most people's window of compassion is only open for certain species. We need to open that window wide and let farmed animals into our site of concern. How can we, in good conscience, kill when it is unnecessary, causing another's death when there is no need and, in fact, is detrimental to our health and the health of the planet? It's simply inconsistent with our ethics. Open your window of compassion and include all animals in your world of care and live vegan. <laughs>
Okay, I would like to introduce our guest now. We are happy to welcome Martha Rosenberg. She is a nationally recognized public health reporter who covers food and drug safety. She contributes to the British Medical Journal, Consumer Reports, Consumers Digest, and the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University and other top publications. Martha has appeared on C-SPAN, National Public Radio. She's lectured at medical schools and universities. We are so happy to have her and her expertise here with us today. So welcome, Martha Rosenberg. Thank you so much, Hope. I'm really happy to be with you, and I have a lot of respect for United Poultry Concerns. Thank you. We appreciate that. And we have a lot of respect for you and all that you have done over the years, uh, writing extensively about animal agriculture in your uh, work. Uh, and I want to get into that, but first I'd, I'd love to know when and why you went vegan and, and maybe also what got you into journalism. What, what is your story? Okay, well, first of all, like many vegans, when I was a little kid, I was just horrified to learn that the meat I was eating was from an animal. And I think by the time I was five, uh, the idea just made me cringe. It, it just, it was antithetical to love animals, but eat what's on your plate. So that was one thing. When I was also young like that, my mom took us to a dairy. And this was back when you had, you know, maybe manual milking. It was like a mon pa kind of a dairy. But I remember seeing these two newborn baby calves and my mom said, um, oh, people eat them, it's called veal. Well, I never got over some of that. And then as I got a little older, I somehow saw a bullfight on TV. I don't know why it was on TV, but anyway, I saw that. And so all these factors came into play Probably the most extreme factor for me was 1970. I read an article about industrial or, or corporate animal farming, modern farming, where you know the animals are drugged and the more modern, and this was known a long time ago. And they talked about how the turkeys had been bred so their breasts were so big that they couldn't mate and a couple of other things. And at that moment, when I was really pretty young, I just said, that's it. I will never eat meat again. I will never support this, this system again. What then drew you to journalism? Once the, um, the internet began, it was pretty, there was a, a real need for content and, you know, opinion pieces. And it was, it kind of opened up to a lot of would-be journalists. And I began writing really about Big Pharma, which I still write about Big Pharma. And some of the news events that really spawned me into being a reporter were the Women's Health Initiative, where so many millions of women have been given hormones. And then they said, oops, it causes cancer. And some of the exposés about what Big Pharma was doing to the public. And that was where I began being a reporter. But I soon discovered that most of this big pharma stuff also applied to animals. And, and so that's sort of how I got into covering animal agriculture and all its hor horrors. So I know that you have written extensively about the chicken industry over the years. How did you get started doing that? And what have you shared with readers about the chicken agribusiness? Well, I should start by saying I love birds and I have two shelter birds myself who, who I love more than any people on this earth. So I'm a, a bird lover anyway, but back- I, I, thought, I think I, I heard them in the background earlier. Uh, <laughs> what are their names? Uh, Miguel and Julie Beth. Aww. Uh, People should know that if, if you love birds and you would like a companion bird, they have shelters just like they do for dogs and cats. So you don't have to patronize the pet stores. You, you can go to shelters. So that's important for people to know. You, you can save, uh, rescue them and yeah. give them, adopt them, give them homes. 
Absolutely. There's particular bird rescues and for different kinds of birds even. Um, we have a, a specific pigeon rescue uh, here in the Bay Area. So in your area, there may be uh, particular bird rescues. Yeah. And especially because the parrots and, and that uh, family of birds, they live so long that sometimes their owners just don't live as long as the birds and they need a new home. So around 2005 or 2006, the mainstream media began exposing the egg industry. And I'm sure you remember this, Hope, because it was really welcome from our viewpoint. And they exposed the, um, you know, the battery hen operations, the, the debeaking of the, of the newborn babies, the crowded conditions, the, the, how the, the egg-laying hens lived with, among dead cage mates. I was very horrified and I began writing about it. And more importantly, I began researching it and discovered that the trade group for egg growers uh, would fight any reforms that would help the, the poor animals. So I was very horrified at the conditions that produced eggs. And I haven't eaten an egg for like 50 years. Wow, but good I was for you. That's at, great. Thank you. But I was especially horrified at what happens to the newborn males at the hatcheries. And I, I say to anybody who will listen, my family, friends, that there is no such thing as an ethical egg, no matter how the, the hen is raised, because of what happens at the hatchery. Right. And the fact that just thousands of newborn little boy um, chickens or chicks are ground up at birth. You know, how can an, an industry like that even exist? And so uh, that sort of uh, pro uh, propelled me to start writing about the egg industry, which I've done for years. I think there have been some reforms, but not at the hatcheries. So your articles have exposed drugs that are used on chickens and other farmed animals uh, like antibiotics and arsenic and hormones and, and the diseases that they're hiding, basically, that they're trying to cover. And this is, of course, very prevalent today with our current pandemic that we have and the connection to zoonotic diseases. Uh, tell us more about this, how you got into this work of, uh, you know, connecting the big pharma and the drugs given to animals. Well, as a reporter, of course, I'm reading the agricultural journals. And I began reading a lot about ructopamine, which is given, it's a growth promoter given to not, not chickens, but given to turkeys and pigs and cows. And I began asking myself, what the heck is this? Obviously, Animal Pharma is making a lot of money selling this, and yet I've never read about it in the press. And I began digging around, and this is just one of many, many drugs that Animal Pharma gives the, the food animals. But this particular one, it's an asthma-like drug, and it promotes growth in the animals. It, like, like several drugs, you know, if you really dig into the records, Hope, it's just shocking the leeway that animal producers take when it comes to drugs in animals. And specifically, a lot of the drugs that are given, and we know they're given antibiotics and hormones and growth producers and also vaccines, a lot of the, the drugs have the uh, provision that it needs to be withdrawn from the food two weeks before the animal is sold to be eaten. And if you look at USDA and FDA records, you'll see many, many citations where farmers have not withdrawn these drugs and there's residues in the, in the meat animals that people eat. The drug rectopamine, which is an asthma-like drug given to pigs and cattle or cows and turkeys. And it was legalized in 1998 for pigs and then it was subsequently legalized for other animals. And as I began digging around the medical journals or the veterinary journals, there, was, there were all sorts of 
studies saying that the animals are harmed and the animals can't move and they fall down and they shake. It was just horrific for the animals, regardless of whether it's in residues that people eat. And as I dug further, I discovered that when the drug first was legalized for farmers to use to make more money by putting more weight on their animals, many, many farmers had called the drug maker and said, you know, my animals are dying on this, they can't walk, you know, this and that. And it, this was never covered by the press. So that's one of the first things I began covering. And, and luckily it did shed some light. I think that some meat is now called rectopamine free. Uh, there was a corollary to this, which relates to a lot of the meat that people eat in the US, which is that overseas, none of the countries we might export to would take this meat with the rectopamine and other chemicals that we use. So they recognize the dangers, whereas we didn't. And um, I might add here that the EU will not take our beef because of the high, high hormone levels. But getting back to rectopamine, many people remember Temple Grandin, who was kind of a, a Ralph Nader of the slaughterhouse. I mean, she obviously believed in killing animals, but she wanted to do it with reforms. And even she says that this rectopamine was causing great harm to the animals. They, they wouldn't move, they couldn't move, they became muscle bound. And then there was rough handling, which of course is euphemistic for the, the sorts of things that are done to animals, such as moving them with forklifts. So I kind of began with the rectopamine. Wow, that's, I mean, amazing. I uh, didn't know a lot of that. So thank you so much for your in-depth reporting on this. I'm, I'm curious about the antibiotics. If you could talk more about antibiotic use, because that's something that, you know, is very prevalent and, and people are concerned about, and we have also a possible antibiotic resistance in humans you know, that, that could cause another pandemic. So this is uh, certainly connected to what's happening now. How have the drug makers gotten around FDA regulations with antibiotics? Tell us a little more about antibiotics. The antibiotic story is one of the more shocking examples of the depths that the livestock industry will stoop to keep their profits. About 2008, there were hearings on Capitol Hill because FDA had wanted to reduce the use of a specific antibiotic, which is the fluoroquinolones. And they're also used in humans. You don't want to overuse them because you get the resistant microbes. But antibiotics are a, a big profit center for big meat. There was a hearing on Capitol Hill in which they, the FDA wanted to reduce or restrict or monitor the use of this family of antibiotics, fluoroquinolones. And what happened was the turkey industry, the dairy industry, the poultry, uh, other poultry producers, the usual suspects, descended upon Capitol Hill and they said to the FDA, we can't farm without antibiotics. We can't do it. That one that I'll never forget this because it's of course relates to poultry concerns, but the Turkey uh, trade group said that with an, without antibiotics, they couldn't squeeze the animals together as we know they do now. And it would require more land and it would require more cost and there'd be more manure because one thing that people don't necessarily understand about antibiotics is their effect on the intestines is such that farmers need to use less feed for the animals. So they, they save a lot of money. That's why the animals gain weight on antibiotics. It's a more efficient feed usage. After these hearings, uh, the FDA backed down and these special interest groups from the livestock and meat industries won. I was just shocked. Mm. So... How is animal farming contributing to antibiotic resistance? This is very interesting, Hope, because it's a medical issue on which veterinarians and doctors are on 
either sides of the question. The veterinarians, the large animal veterinarians, are pro-antibiotic because they serve big meat, whereas doctors are horrified at how many microbes and pathogens have become resistant to our common antibiotics. You might remember maybe 10 years ago, there was a expose about pink slime and nobody, it was going to the school lunches because, you know, the, the school lunches buys the meat nobody wants. But this pink slime created a quite a, a stir because what they were doing was treating the raw ground beef with ammonia puffs, okay, to kill E. coli. Now, why are they using ammonia puffs? Because all the antibiotics don't work anymore. Because big meat sells antibiotics by the ton. They're, I'm sorry, they're using, what was it? Ammonia? What were you saying? Ammonia, what are you yes. They were treating the, the ground beef with ammonia gas. Because of the way these poor animals are raised and the slaughterhouse conditions, many, I'm going to say most, animals harbor bacteria. And E. coli is a very common bacteria found in, in many, you know, many of the animals, many, uh -huh. a lot of the livestock. The e, e. coli is not killed by a lot of the antibiotics that once killed it because of the antibiotic resistance that we're talking about. Because the antibiotics are no longer able to kill an E. coli or maybe a salmonella and some of the other uh, common livestock pathogens, they were using the ammonia gas to kill the E. coli in the ground beef before they sent it to the National School Lunch Program. Wow. I'm laughing because it was so disgusting and, and people for the first time realized that stuff is going on on the farms and in, in livestock production that's just sickening on every level. It's, it's cruelty to animals, it's disgusting to eat, and so that was one example of the antibiotic resistance. It drove to the use of the ammonia gas. There was about maybe five years ago, I think it was Tyson, and I could be wrong, but it was a poultry producer, announced that they were no longer feeding arsenic to their turkeys. And most of the nation was like, no longer. We didn't know you were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so then when I looked into that further, arsenic was being fed to turkeys to gain, not only make them gain weight, but also produce a certain color that was considered um, appetizing to people who buy these things. And so the arsenic was also a kind of de facto antibiotic. And I might add here another thing, you know, some people don't realize that fish also suffer and fish are also animals and they eat salmon, which I've never eaten it in my life. But one thing that farm salmon does not have is that pink color that people think is natural. In point of fact, it's a pigment, pigment that's given to the aquaculture raised salmon. I just want to mention that because we're talking about the color of the turkeys. FDA continued to try to regulate antibiotics against all odds. And they did ban a few, one called Batril that was given to chickens. Uh, they did ban it, but the sad fact is it's still found in residues even, even this year or last year. So enforcement is an issue. So the antibiotic effects or attempts of FDA have really not worked. One, one attempt a few years ago was to have no more routine dosing of animals with antibiotics requiring a, a prescription and a reason to give the animal the antibiotics. Well, all that happened there was that these farmers, and that's always in quotes farmers because they're really operators of you know, sweatshops, but I call them farmers here. All they did was then say, this animal's sick, it needs antibiotics, and they lied, when in point of fact, it's for growth purposes, because they save money. 
So the antibiotics, I would say, are really, really central to animal-based agriculture, um, at least in this country, probably in Europe, though I think there's a few more uh, regulations there. I always say to people, if you knew the types of diseases that animals um, on farms are susceptible to, the ick factor alone would keep you from eating them, even if you didn't care about their suffering. So, Martha, you've written a lot about farm animal abusers and the abuse of farm animals and their suffering in animal agribusiness. Why is it that it so seldom ends in charges for the individuals or for the companies? Well, you know, Hope, that is a very, very good question because it explains some of the directions that the animal rights movement has gone into. When I first began working in these areas, probably more as an activist than a reporter, we would go to these rural locations where stories had, had been told about you know, animals freezing to death on trucks, or one example was hens put in wood chippers, and we'd go and we'd speak to the local authorities our, you know, rural, let's say district attorneys or prosecuting attorneys. And the, the response we got was a big yawn because, you know, animals are, 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 here, are here for us to eat, they think. And so we would get uh, a big yawn from, let's say we go to Springfield. And one, one of my colleagues said that he was so sick of looking at the bottom of the shoes of these legislators because they they were they had their feet up on the desk. They just didn't didn't give a darn. And so what began to happen with the animal rights movement was they realized they had to go directly to the food producers, whether it be a Wendy's or a Kentucky Fried Chicken or a McDonald's, and expose to the the potential customers what is happening to these animals before they, they're sold. There were horrific stories that never came to um, charges. I always say that wherever you find animal abuse on a farm, you also find worker abuse, environmental abuse, and probably a product that abuses its, the person who eats it. They're, they're all very interconnected. So there was a huge, I called him the egg tycoon, Jack DeCoster. And he had many, many egg operations uh, all over the country. Some of the eggs were recalled because they harmed people, but my focus is on the animals. And he had a particular egg operation in Maine that was so egregious that the local authorities did come in to raid it. And I found this so interesting, Hope, is the people who went into radio, local law officials, fainted and got sick and had to go to doctors just for being in, from being in those barns wow. for a few minutes. And, you know, and, they're, and the animals are supposed to live there. And that's, of course, from the ammonia from, well, you know, the conditions. I always say if the law enforcers couldn't, got, got sick from a few minutes, what about the animals and also what about the workers and these workers at this particular egg farm in maine uh, were living in trailers with vermin they were as abused as animals and we should talk about slaughterhouses because it's the same thing but were any operator who's willing to abuse animals is also willing to abuse workers and vice versa so during COVID-19, there's been a lot of focus on slaughterhouses because so many workers have come down with the virus. It draws attention, or it should draw attention, to the conditions in these places, which are egregious. A big meat producer, I believe it was Smithfield, but it could have been Swift, in North Carolina, had a program to allow prisoners to leave their cells, you know, tight security felon, felony uh, prisons, to leave their cells to work in the slaughterhouse because it was that difficult to get workers to do that, that type of work. 
and the prisoners would not do it. They, they literally said, no, we'd rather stay in our cell. That's how bad the slaughterhouses are. Cheap meat and, and, and the slaughterhouses is very reliant on worker abuse. And the slaughterhouses are no place anyone wants to even drive by, much less work in. One more thing I really would like to add, Hope, if we have time, because I think it's so relevant, is bird flu and mass diseases from the industrial farms. In 2014, 15, and 2016, the U.S. experienced a major avian flu epidemic, which was hidden from the public to a large extent. If you read what happened, the animals, the birds were gassed and depopulated in, in the amount of millions. And yet the news never really hit the public because so many of the mainstream news advertisers are meat producers or process producers who don't particularly want their customers to see big piles of depopulated animals. The depopulation of these poor birds is done with a fire extinguisher foam-like material that suffocates them. Again, this was kept out of the news. It was millions and millions of innocent birds, many of which were only killed for prevention because the greedy farmers didn't want their whole flock to become infected. So if one got infected, the whole flock would be killed because to these farmers, the, the animals are just as disposable as heads of lettuce. They don't think of them as sentient beings. The avian flu was very much hidden and will happen again because of the crowded antibiotic-based farming practices seen in the U.S. and other industrialized countries. Yeah, good point. So I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about animal-free meats like the Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger and all these meats that, that really mimic meat and are seen as game changers. And many believe they can really speed the transition to a, to a vegan planet. But there are detractors and some are some, some groups are attacking these plant-based meats. Who, who are they and why do you think this is happening? So the plant-based meats, I believe, are wonderful. I think the people that develop those plant-based meats realize they could create food that tasted just as good without the animal suffering and slaughter, without the worker suffering, without the environmental impact. The plant-based meats are being bashed by certainly, well, no, this is ironic, Hope. The, the big meat producers, such as Conagra and Tyson and Purdue and, you know, the usual suspects, they're kind of going to go into that because they realize that their business model of murdering animals and bringing in illegal workers and abusing them and polluting the environment isn't going to work anymore. So well, some yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a money maker. It's what's being demanded. So that, that's why they're interested. Right, right. So they're not as much threatened by the plant-based meat as are the smaller producers who are trying to say, well, it's not organic and it's GMO and it's not healthful and it's quote unquote fake and it's Silicon Valley, which I am very offended by that because a product that does not require slaughter is to me, ipso facto, a better product that is non-negotiable. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that that needs to be the number one concern right now. And that's what these plant-based mimicking meats address. They don't slaughter animals to create the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Burger. And that should be our number one concern. I think once we you know, have a, 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 the animals free of suffering, then we can talk about you know the health aspects and other things and and we certainly can do that along the way you know make it a little healthier maybe get them to change to not using gmos but i think those concerns like you said should be secondary at this point uh and we should be promoting and supporting these animal free meats any way that we can 
So Martha, this has been a really wonderful conversation. We do have to wrap up soon. And I wanted to ask you, what gives you hope? So I get hope from the young people, hope, because if you look at not just millennials, but Generation Z, you see a lot more vegan awareness and vegans. Yeah. And I think I've seen the numbers put at maybe 11%. It just doesn't compute if you're against racism and against um, different um, homophobia, Islamophobia, ageism, sexism, racism. Speciesism is in there. And I think a lot of the young people kind of see that. So that gives me quite a bit of hope. I, I don't know too many really young people who, who, want, um, who are meat lovers. And, and so that, that's a wonderful trend. Well, Martha, it's been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Hope. I, I know that we both believe so much in these issues, and it's wonderful to reach some people with this podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on, uh, Martha Rosenberg. And thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast. You can support this podcast by leaving a rating, a review, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, you can also support us with a donation to upc-online.org. Please have hope for a better world for animals and live vegan.